I would ask again tonight, please, ask yourself that question, why am I here? And as you go through the week, ask yourself that question. Brother Jerry mentioned earlier about the lesson this morning, and that it is very encouraging to me to think that a lesson that was presented that was actually pondered upon during the day. I very much appreciate that from Brother Jerry, and the thought is, uh, that is what a wonderful example that is, is that's really the way it ought to be. It really should be thought about, and uh, it, it really is something that is of that much of an importance to us. We should really be focusing on these things uh, rather than the things of the world, thinking about these wonderful things and putting you in that spiritual mind that you want to do the things that are right, and you are looking forward to having the privilege of coming back and studying more and worshiping God and assembling together. So again, as we go into the study tonight in Romans chapter 8, uh, please, again, uh, have that same attitude. We'll go through quickly. Uh, this is basically the core that we have here tonight that is here most every Sunday night. So we know uh, the outline from Romans chapter 1 through chapter 8. I'll go through it quickly. I won't spend much time on that. Uh, and then we will uh, get into Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 33. We said that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, the inspiration of God. Uh, it was God breathed, the second Timothy. 16 and 17, Romans chapter 1 verse 5, Romans 16 and verse 26, you have obedience to the faith and obedience of faith. The book is opened and closed with that concept, that thought, and that is obedient faith, and that is the only faith that is of any merit whatsoever. We recognize Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17, think the book, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith and faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We so often say that, and I know that you hear it a lot, but think about what that says in Romans 1 verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Where? Where? In God's revealed word in the New Testament. You know where you're not going to find it? You're not going to find it in synods. You're not going to find it in the catechisms of men. You're not going to find it in creed books. You're going to find it right here in God's inspired word. Therein, the gospel, verse 16, is where the righteousness of God is revealed. Now that isn't, as we've said before, that isn't speaking specifically of God's own righteousness, but rather that is the way that man can be deemed righteous in God's sight. And that is through the gospel. And again, you can't be saved any other way. Romans 1, uh, verses 18 through 32, Paul chose all Gentiles to be under condemnation. Chapter 2, Jews are under condemnation. Verse 13, we recognize that not hearers of the law are just, but doers of the law are justified or just before God. So we recognize in chapter 3, you have of Romans, uh, verse 19, what's there of the law saying? It's saying to those under the law that all may be guilty before God. Every person that has ever lived on this planet has been under some form of law. Whether it was the law in the garden, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, whether it was the law of Moses to those Jews, Deuteronomy chapter 5, or whether it was the patriarchs who had a different law and not an elaborate uh, law with all of the ordinances that the Jews did, but they were still under the law. Otherwise, they could never sin. So, of course, we recognize that all men have been under sin, the law, and all are condemned before God because the law and perfect keeping of it, no man will be justified. Romans 3, verse 20. Galatians 3, verse 11. So we have it summed up in Romans 3, verse 23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Now again, we said in verse 24, we now have a contrast again of that condemnation. And then we have redemption in verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. And God has set Christ to be a propitiation and appeasement. Romans 3, verses 24 and 25, God is a just God, and He had to find a way to justify man and He Himself be just. Romans 3, verse 26, and of course, he did that through a vicarious sacrifice through Christ. And that is how we have that wonderful blessing. Romans 5, verse 11, that is how we have received the atonement. Romans chapter 4, we recognize that that is where uh, Abraham is spoken of. Paul, the inspiration, shows that righteousness is not of the law of Moses, because Abraham was deemed righteous before the law of Moses came into existence. Some four centuries before Abraham, or before the law came into play, Abraham was justified by faith. We say often in Romans 4, 6 through 8, you have the, the negative and positive looking at the same, uh, the same uh, principle. 
And that is that blessed is the man whom the Lord will not reckon sin unto, and blessed is the man whom the Lord will reckon or refute righteousness to. And that is apart from works of the law. That isn't apart from any works. We'll see that in Romans 6, 17 and 18. We're going to be doing something. You're serving something. You're obeying something. Romans 6 verse 16. But that is specific to the works of the law of Moses. We showed in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, we have access into grace by faith. And we rejoice in hope. That's a lot of what the theme of Romans as we get to chapter 8 is. Uh, and that is hope. We rejoice in hope in the glory of God. Romans 5 and verse 2. Romans 5, beginning in verse 6. You have that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. While we were in the world and, and outside of Christ, He died for us. He made it possible to redeem even us who deserve death. Romans 6, verse 23. He gave Himself for us. He is that Lamb. John 1, verse 23. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12 through 21, you have that by, sin, or, uh, by one man sin entered the world, and that's Adam, and by one man righteousness entered the world, uh, as we continue on in that chapter. Now we said that the sin, that uh, the death was produced by this sin in Romans 5 verse 12, it was not spirit by physical death, but it's spiritual death. That's what it's talking about. And we can see that made uh, obvious by the continuing context, and in the next chapter especially, regarding... Uh, being dead and in some way other than actual physically dying. So we have Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21, comparing or, or making a comparison and a contrast between Adam and Christ. And how by one man sin entered the world, and by one man righteousness entered the world. And by one man, the conditions came forth that man could actually choose to sin and be subject to the temptation because of Adam introducing sin into the world. And by one man, uh, you can make a choice and do right, First John 3 and verse 7, and obey the gospel, Romans 1 verse 16, and you can actually be forgiven of sins, and that is through Christ. And again, we say so often that it's false to say that all men are sinners because of Adam, as it is to say that all men are righteous because of Christ. You have two extremes. You have Calvinism, which teaches that all men are born depraved and we inherit sin. That's false. You won't find it in this book. And then you also have universalism that says all men are saved regardless of what you do. It's false. Show it to them. It's not in there. But the truth of the matter is, is they came and they introduced this into the world and a comparison is made between Christ and Adam. You have in chapter 6, the question is asked, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul answers it, God forbid. He says in verse 2 through 7, as we read uh, this morning, he shows that we're dead to sin. He shows that we've been baptized into Christ, into his death. Verse 3, that we've been immersed into Christ. That's buried with him. Verse 4, and that we would also rise to walk in a new life. Verse 4. Uh, also, do you know that some people say that that's speaking of Holy Spirit baptism, folks? That is, it's not biblical. It's not what the Bible teaches. We don't receive Holy Spirit baptism today. Holy Spirit baptism was a promise, not a command. It was only promised to certain people, John 14 through 16. And guess what? We're not one. You can't be immersed into the Spirit, and then you raised up out of the Spirit, and we're no longer in the Spirit. Is that how it works? Of course, we recognize that's false. Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, that when we are baptized into Christ, we are immersed into Christ, that is where we are planted together with Him. We are united with Him. And that is where we receive these wonderful spiritual blessings, the benefits of His death, Matthew 26, verse 28, Colossians 2, 11 through 13. Romans chapter 6, he continues down. It shows we're dead to sin, and he comes down into verse 16, and of course he's, he asks this question. Know you not that in whom you submit yourselves servants to obey, His servants you are, whether of two choices, sin unto death, or obedience unto righteousness. And as we so often mention, you can reference Romans 2 and verse 8 to Romans 6 and verse 16 because you've got two choices. You're going to obey something. Whether it's yourself, whether it's somebody else, or whether it's God, you're going to obey something. And it's a conscious decision to obey God, and it does require effort. Romans chapter 7. We said that the allegory is made in the first four verses. You have uh, Paul teaching... <clears throat> That the nation of Israel was amenable to the law of Moses, until which time that law was taken away by he who gave it. That's God. In uh, verse 4, you see that the, the law was taken away, the cross of Christ, Colossians 2 and verse 14, and they were free now to marry another. That's Jesus. He wanted Israel to abandon that law that had been done away with by God himself and to obey the gospel and be faithful to Christ under the new covenant. And, of course, we'll see more of that as we continue in the next chapter, in the next chapter, in the next chapter. Romans 9 to 11, we'll see that. We continue. Romans chapter 7, we said beginning in verse 14. 
We recognize a literary device being caught to show the man outside of Christ, the man under the law, the man who is not in receiving of these spiritual blessings as of yet. You have a contrast in chapter 7 of a carnal mind, and you have a contrast under the law then. And in chapter 8, we said that we have a contrast uh, again on the other side of that, and that is now, verse 1, in Christ there is therefore no condemnation. To who? Those in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's why the Spirit's teachings, as revealed by the Holy Spirit to these inspired men, and recorded for us today so that we have them in written form, John 6 and verse 63. The words that these inspired men had and they received and they wrote, they are spirit and they are life. We said in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 6, he pretty well sums up the first half of that chapter, and he says to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we have that contrast, chapter 8, of the spiritual mind to a carnal mind. We continue down in chapter 8, and we get to some difficult verses, as we've said, and we've studied those, and we've still got outlines back there for them. If not, if you need some, I'd be glad to go over those again with you at some point. But we said beginning uh, in verse 16, we have hope. If you could sum up verses 16 through 39 of chapter 8, you could use one word, hope. We have, for the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, that we are the sons of God. How does he do that for us today, folks? He does it today through his word. It's been revealed, and it's been confirmed, and we have it. And if we say that we've done, and we can honestly say that we've done the things that the Holy Spirit has said to do through his word, then we know where we stand with God, therefore he bears witness of that. Beginning uh, verse 16, we said that you start to see a lot of hope being spoken of. Verses 17 through 21, with the exception of verse 20, you have the creation is spoken of there, and you have each verse there speaking of the creation and hope associated with it. And then you have in verse 22, uh, the preacher, you have the same Greek word translated, but the, the King James at least translates two different there. And we said that that could be a, a, uh, a, a, a going in a different direction with that regarding someone other than that, that, uh, that class of people that were spoken of in verses 17 through 21. And again, I agree with that. We have chapter 8, verse 26. We've mentioned, uh, we went over that in detail. And again, we, we, we submitted what we did uh, humbly, recognizing that there are different views on that. And as long as no false doctrine is taught, and as long as uh, it doesn't contradict any plain passages of Scripture, how you view that, uh, it, it, we won't go into uh, uh, a big argument about any of that. Tonight, we're going to look at verses 33 through 34. We're going to go back through uh, as we get started and begin in verse 28 and read uh, these several verses just to make sure that we remember the context in which this is written, written so that we can better understand these verses. So we have verses 28 through 32. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That is the context of what we're getting into tonight in verse 33. Now let's look at verse 33. It says this, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. We have a rhetorical question, of course. Paul, again, is using various means to teach. He's, he's asking this. We can understand that as we teach so often that we can ask a question that is actually rhetorical to drive a point home and to emphasize this truth. So this is what we have here. What does this mean, though, in the first clause? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Does that mean, folks, that we can be forgiven of sin and all physical consequences are erased? No, it doesn't. Do we recognize that we can be forgiven of sin and we still have to pay a price for it here on earth. Do we recognize that? No one can lay blame to a man or accuse a man to God when he has already been forgiven. But we recognize that we can be forgiven of sin and we may still have to pay the price physically. For instance, if I was convicted of murder and I murdered someone, but in prison I, I, was, uh, I had uh, a contact with someone who was a evangelist enough to send me some material regarding the church where I found the Bible and read for myself and recognized that I was under condemnation and I needed to change 
and I believed in Christ and His Word, and I repented of my sins, and I confessed Christ before men, and I was baptized for the remission of sins, I am forgiven. But does that mean they're going to let me go to prison? No, it doesn't. There are times that you'll still have to pay physically. And I want to show that with this illustration. 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 13, I'll read these for you. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Now, of course, we know the context here. This is where David, uh, Nathan comes to David and tells him the story of the little ewe lamb. How that David had taken Bathsheba from Uriah, and he had had Uriah killed by the sword, put him in the front of the battle, and, and letting him get killed just to cover his own sin of adultery, and now he was guilty of murder. So now that David, David has realized this, he makes his confession. And look uh, look how quickly the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Then Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him and raised him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread within. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we, if we tell him that the child is dead? Continue to notice. But when David saw his servants whisper, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst eat and rise, uh, rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back? I shall go to him, but he shall never return to me. What a sad story. What a terrible price that you have to pay for sin sometimes. David was forgiven, yet he still had consequences for his actions. Young folks, listen up. That's a good lesson to learn. Before you get yourself into trouble, think about it. Don't do it. Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. Regarding this, what we had, uh, what were uh, the first clause here? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Notice this. Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength. Notice that. Now, we said, Revelation chapter 12 is about Christ. You picture his life in one short verse. And his life is spoken of and his death and vicarious sacrifice and his resurrection making redemption possible. And you now have, now has come salvation and strength. It's been realized through Christ. And the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. Who? The saints overcame Satan. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. What Paul is saying here is similar to what John saw. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Think about it. Everybody in here, I'm sure, has read the book of Job. Have you ever asked yourself in Job, verses chapters 1 and 2, when the sons of God presented themselves unto God, Satan was there, and he accused Job, didn't he? Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11 shows that in some way, whether it's metaphorical teaching or in some other way we have, that Satan could accuse even those who were the very elect, they were accused until the sacrifice of Christ was actually a reality. But then at that point, it can no longer be an accusation brought against them because that precious blood has removed those sins. And they could not be accused anymore. The vicarious offering of Christ became a reality. Satan could no longer accuse the brethren. Why? Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb. God is just. Obviously, Satan knew that. God is just. 
And Satan would accuse these individuals and say, if God is a just God, and, and I'm not quoting anything here, I'm simply paraphrasing how this could have gone about, saying to God who is a just God, how can you be a just God and not condemn these sinners who are worthy of death? And when the, the sacrifice of Christ and his resurrection became a reality, now that cannot be. Because that blood has actually and literally been spilled. It has been shed and it has become a reality. Therefore, Satan can no longer accuse those elect. The sins that have been forgiven have been completely forgiven. That's why no one can lay a charge to God against any of his because they have been forgiven of their sins. Notice Psalm 103, verses 8 through 13. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Notice Hebrews 8, verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 10, verses 16 through 22. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. A quote from Jeremiah 31. Saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. <clears throat> and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus... By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. <clears throat> and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. <clears throat> that sacrifice made it possible. Therefore, no one can lay anything to the charge of God's elect because they have been forgiven of sin. Now, who are the elect? Thayer defines elect as picked out or chosen. How are they elect? Elect. How are they elected? How are they chosen? <clears throat> According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Ephesians 1 verse 4. How are the elect chosen? They were chosen in Christ. And any individual who would be elect would have to obey that gospel to get in Christ. That's how God chose. <clears throat> Let's ask this. Ephesians 1 verse 4 was written to who? The Ephesians. Was it? How were the Ephesians chosen? If we find out how the Ephesians were chosen, can't we understand and infer how we likewise could be chosen? Acts 19 Verses 1 through 5, that gives you the conversion account of those in Ephesus. Then it came to pass that while Apollos was a court, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This shows how those in Ephesus were accepted in the Beloved, Ephesians 1 verse 6, how they were chosen in him, they were baptized into him, they obeyed the gospel, and that is how they became the elect, the chosen. Keep following me. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How, Paul? Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. If you believe the truth, which is the Spirit's teachings, you're going to follow it, aren't you? And if you follow it, that's going to set you apart from everybody else. Isn't it? Ex uh, Exodus 19 and verse 5. The nation of Israel will be a peculiar people among all the earth. Why? Because they would be different. They would be set apart. That's what it means. Sanctified, made holy. They would be set apart how? By following the instruction from the Lord. And the same is true for us today. 1 John 3, 7 through 10. James 2 and verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he had promised to them to love him? How are we made partakers of that kingdom? 
who delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Colossians 1, verse 13. John said in Revelation chapter 1 that he was a fellow member. He was a partaker of the sufferings and the kingdom. When? In the first century. Do you know that Jehovah's Witnesses say that the kingdom came in 1914? Can you believe that? That's ridiculous. The kingdom came in the first century. The kingdom is the church. They're synonymous. That's ridiculous. What about this? 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that the same thing Paul said in Colossians 1 verse 13? Who delivered us out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love. That is marvelous light. The kingdom of Christ. What about this? Revelation 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. How are we chosen? We just showed you. We're chosen in Christ. How are we called? 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. Through the gospel, how are we faithful? We faithfully obey the teachings of the Lord. So we now have in this verse, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. He asked the question showing that it's an absurdity to say that any man could go and could accuse a member of the body of Christ to God since these sins have been forgiven. And now he shows it is God that justifies. It is God that makes righteous. Salvation is of God, is it not? Isaiah 52, beginning verse 7. <clears throat> How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. peace. Paul quoted this in Romans 10, didn't he? Mm -hmm. That bringeth forth good tidings of, of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, and the voice together shall, say, uh, shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people and hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Salvation is from God. That's what Romans 1 verse 17 teaches. The righteousness of God. That is, God's way to deem man righteous is through which what, what medium? The gospel, verse 16. So we have all of these things saying the same thing. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. <clears throat> he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. With those garments. Didn't we read about that in the book of Revelation in that day? Luke 3, 4 through 6. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and, his, and a hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Salvation is of God. It's from God. How's this salvation offered? Notice Acts 13, verse 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sin. How is it? Salvation is from God, and how is it that it's made possible? By God's word. And what does it do? It teaches us. Titus 2, 11 and 12. The word of his salvation, of course, is the gospel of Christ. Romans 1, 16 and 17. This is how man is judged before God. Romans 5, verse 1. That is... By faith, obedient faith. Verse 34. <clears throat> Paul asked the question in verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is God to justify? Now we have Paul saying, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, day, brethren, who is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So we have a continuation of the thought in verse 33. Paul asked, Who is he that condemns the ones that God has justified? Who is it? Paul asked. And again, this is rhetorical. This is showing that this is emphasizing the point that the, uh, no man can condemn the man for you. 
Again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there are physical consequences at times, but I'm saying spiritually speaking. And this is going to give great comfort to these individuals as we're going to continue to see in verse 35 all the way through verse 39. It's going to keep that context of hope that started in verse 16. It is Christ that died. We recognize that this as a fact, don't we? 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once delivered or suffered for sins, the just from the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. 1 Peter 1, or 1 Peter 2, 23-24 says, Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his body on a tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Peter quotes from Isaiah 53. It's a fact that Christ died, isn't it? It's a fact that Christ was raised, isn't it? Yea, rather, he died, but he is risen again. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. You have a picture. You have a snapshot of the gospel. That is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And of course you have that shown and exemplified and symbolized in obedience to the gospel. When we die to sin, we're buried and we're raised to walk in a new life. Of course, we all recognize that Romans 6, 3 through 5, and 17 and 18. The fact of Christ's resurrection is a vital aspect of our redemption. Romans 4, verse 25 says Christ was risen for our justification. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 17, regarding this resurrection from the dead, because we need to understand how important that is to us if we are going to be redeemed. Christ had to rise. But if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith also is vain. Yea, if we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised a Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead not rise. For if the, uh, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Why? Because His resurrection proved His deity. And if He didn't rise, if he didn't rise from the grave like He said He was, then He was just a man and He was a liar. And of course we recognize that isn't the case. He did raise from the grave. Same chapter, beginning in verse 20. <clears throat> but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Remember the, the contrast that Paul gave in Romans 5? Adam and Christ. Here we go. That's exactly what he's saying. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. What about on the right hand of God? What does that symbolize? Of course, right hand shows power and strength. Who is even at the right hand of God? Notice this. Mark 16 and verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto him, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Luke 22 and verse 69. Acts 2 and verse 33. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Acts 2 and verse 33. Acts 5 and verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Where is Christ? The right hand of God. Acts 7, 55, after Stephen was being stoned and he looked up and saw this vision. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. We know that Christ died, yea, rather who is risen from the grave, who also maketh intercession for us. What a comforting thought. We said this the other day. If Abraham's intercession helped Lot, and it did, Genesis 19, verse 29, and it helped Abimelech, Genesis 20, 17 and 18, healing him of that disease, that plague, how much assurance do we have of the intercession of Christ for us? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 9, verse 20. who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. Hebrews 7, 
24 through 28. But this man, because he continueth forever, <clears throat> continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that draw nigh to God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sin, then for the sins of the people. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son, who is consecrated forever. He makes intercession for us, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but is within all manner, uh, in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain, uh, obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What a thought. Mm -hmm. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, who is risen from the grave, who also maketh intercession for us. We have a context of hope, of joy that it should bring. I know that this is a favorite chapter of some, Romans chapter 8, and, and it's with good reason. You have such wonderful hope. We said that this was divine commentary on the book of Revelation. Hope. Hope during affliction and during trials. It's hope. It's still hope. And it comforts us today, knowing that our Lord does make intercession for even us today. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. If there are any today that have never obeyed the gospel of Christ. If you're of a capital age and you've never obeyed the gospel, you are lost. Hear the word of God. As that is how faith is produced. Romans 10 verse 17. Upon your faith you will change your mind and change your actions regarding sin. That is repentance. It's commanded all for all men everywhere. Acts 17 verse 30. If you want to know what repentance entails, read Matthew 21 verses 28 and 29. Read Matthew 12, verse 41, and reference John 3. You will see it's a change in mind and change in actions because of that. Confess Christ before men. Confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, verse 10. Be baptized for the remission of sins. That is where you are united with Christ. That is where you are forgiven of sins, Acts 22, and verse 16. Be faithful unto the end and receive that wonderful prize that we're all striving for. For those who have obeyed the gospel, perhaps you've fallen away or been led astray. Perhaps there's something in your life that needs to be made right. Friends, there's no reason to hesitate. There's no reason to put it off. We all fall short. If there's things in our lives, though, that we're doing and we need to acknowledge, we need to change our mind, please do so. If you need the prayers of the church, if you need us to pray with you and for you, we'll do that. Whatever we can do to help, that's why we're here, to help each other and to serve the Lord as we are. The invitation is yours. If you need anything, please come down.